Um, our first uh, panel is going to look at the challenges and opportunities facing regulators in the journey to net zero. And as regulators, they are tasked with overseeing an accelerated transition in a coordinated manner, whilst also ensuring the most efficient long-term solutions for customers. All of us in the room here are energy consumers in one here, uh, way, shape or form, so it's good to hear directly from you on the progress to date. Um, and we're going to hear about all the challenges the regulators are facing, what's coming next, what's in, uh, the important factors for them. And again, we would ask you to really engage in the dialogue today through the Slido app. So uh, please uh, give a warm welcome to Laura Bryan, who's the CEO of the Maritime Area Regulatory Authority, to Jim Gannon, Chairperson and Commissioner at the Commission for the Regulation of Utilities, and John French, who is the Chief Executive of the Utility Regulator in Northern Ireland. So you're all very, very welcome to give seats. <laughs> Thank you, go ahead. Yes. Thank you. So there we go. Everyone settled in. Um, Jim, we were just mentioning to um, with Michael, just kind of talking about how obviously Europe is on a mission to decarbonize and digitize and reindustrialize. Um, but I think the last couple of years have sort of rattled uh, the European status quo, uh, particularly if anyone read uh, Letta's report last week on competitiveness uh, and innovation. We really do seem to be falling behind, particularly the US um, and China. But from a policy perspective, the direction is, as Michael said, it's, it's clear. But do we have what it takes to meet those targets and to meet them on time? So I think European policy for maybe the last 10 or 15 years was very much prioritizing decarbonization and being a global leader in that, not at any cost, but with a willing acceptance of cost. I think COVID was interesting in that we saw disruption of society and supply chain, and that introduced the first price crisis of the last three or four years. Um, the political and policy response to that seemed to be primarily focused on cost of living as a component of price. And when we talk about cost of living, it tends to be more retail, residential, as distinct from industrial competitiveness. I think what we've seen then with the recent conflict with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia um, was really a focus more on security, resilience, reliance, and consideration of bad actors. And I think the dialogue then around the price became not just about cost of living, it became more about competitiveness because competitiveness was linked to industrial and economic security and resilience. And there's an enormous focus on that. And it's not just about electrons and molecules anymore. It is about rare earth metals. It is about chips and where they're being produced. And it is looking at the IRA in the United States and considering what that means for industrialization, economic resilience, external reliance, external risk, and then how we support and supply energy to that while decarbonizing, so there has been a shift. And that's both in public utterances and in policy consideration over the last period of time. I think interestingly for Ireland, and Michael Liebrich mentioned it, is that we do have a significant excess of primary energy resource, and we don't have heavy industry, which is different to Europe, and we need to consider that. I think one of our key challenges and opportunities is how we match the intermittent resources that we have and that are accessible by very much now conventional technologies. Nothing new, nothing different, nothing innovative. These technologies have been running for years. How do you match that to the type of demand that we have? And then how do we treat the excess such that we enjoy economic growth for it? So I think actually we have the fundamental resources. I think the policy, policy North Star is there for us. And I think it's a matter of how we deliver that. And some of that, without getting into the technology in any detail at all, I'll stop now. Um, you know, you have, you have to have load shifting of a certain description. You have to look at the price signal, and whether that's through the retail price or more dynamic network tariffs, so that the people in their home with technologies that facilitate it can respond to that price signal, or the people in industry with their ability to invest can also respond to that price signal. That can be on site, it can be grid scale, it can be interconnection, ultimately, when you look outside your own borders. I think what's interesting for Ireland is that it is hard to see a future where we not only need the diurnal day-night investment and load shift over the course of a 24, 36-hour period, it's hard to see Ireland being able to avoid the need for 100 to 150-hour storage at some point in time. 
and whether that is provided by the storage of electrons, the storage of molecules, the use of water, or even heavier substances being pumped up and down the side of hills. Uh, there is a particular point there, whatever technology provides that service, where we will probably need that. Um, thank you very, very much for that. Laura, the role of MARA is probably slightly different to uh, the other regulators here today. And I know in many senses you're still just in startup mode, but we probably are the envy of a lot of uh, countries with a marine area up to uh, 10 times our land mass. Can you maybe just explain to us um, a little bit about MARA and what kind of the role you think that that will help um, in veering towards net zero? Yeah, I mean, I think... So obviously MARA was established sort of back in July with a couple of key objectives and it's really all about kind of supporting good marine spatial planning. As, as you said, we, we are the envy of a lot of countries in Europe. You know, we have a sea area seven to ten times the size of our landmass. I mean, if you look at other countries like Belgium and the Netherlands, they have sort of skinny bits of coast that they're bumping up against their neighbours. They have limited ability to sort of use that for development. We, we have the luxury of, of large areas and, and sort of the challenge for us is how do we make the best use of that space, um, you know, and a lot of kind of where sort of the, the you know, the development and, and sort of the drive for offshore renewables is responding to sort of the same European challenges that Jim talked about, which was, you know, increasing our energy independence, increasing our energy security, the recognition that we should be able to generate sort of, um, you know, we should be using our resources that, that we have rather than importing fossil fuels that are directly impacted by sort of the, the broader, um, you know, global environment. I mean, I think sort of what Mara does then, I think is kind of quite similar to what uh, uh, kind of the CRU or, or the utility regular do, regulator does. I mean, we're here to sort of provide coherent, transparent, and um, consistent decision making and provide regulatory certainty for um, people who are investing in basically high value, long lived assets. Now, we, we look at it sort of from the aspect of two things, you know, and we'd sort of talk about the regulatory tools that we have, which would be a maritime area consent and a marine usage license. So where, where we probably again are quite similar is, you know, if you think about maybe what CRU does with regard to sort of grid access rules, you're trying to allocate access to a scarce resource, Mar is doing exactly the same thing. Our scarce resource is the seabed. So what we're doing is making sure that, and kind of my, my sort of tagline is the right development in the right place. Like that, that's our role is to sort of facilitate the best use of that resource that we have. Probably where we differ a little bit is in Mar and our decision making is our objective is a little bit different. Maybe kind of and don't want to put words in the mouth, but often sort of an economic regulator is looking into sort of protecting the interests of consumers. So that's sort of a lot of the driver of their decision making. Um, where we're looking at it is more about protecting the interests of the state. So the state is kind of the owner of the seabed. And so what we're doing is, is looking at sort of making those trade-offs, managing that spatial squeeze for the overall interest of the state and the citizen. And so, you know, we're balancing, you know, what do you want to be using your resource for? Is this an area for sort of conservation? Is this an area for fishing? Is this an area for economic development? And that economic development might be offshore wind, or it might be telecoms development. It might be tourism. Um, <coughs> you know, so sort of, you know, we deal with everything from, as you said, the offshore wind telecom cables, but also, you know, dredging of harbours so that cruise ships can get in there or the building of slipways or the building of marinas or pontoons to, to support uh, tourism. So it's, it's sort of, a, that's really where we differ is kind of the sort of, sort of the objective. But a lot of our tools and a lot of the role of a regulator is very similar. It's interesting because earlier this week is up at the fabulous uh, Titanic Belfast, uh, the, the Maritime Mile and extraordinary plans to extend that waterfront out by 10 kilometers. Um, and it was interesting, uh, John, because it was at an event where people were just so relieved that there was a minister. <laughs> just so relieved that there was a minister to welcome into the room. And obviously the power sharing institutions have been finally restored, but that two year stasis has, has been really, really uh, challenging. What impacts has that had uh, for you and the work you've been trying to do? 
It's had a huge, you know, it's brilliant they're back up and running. Um, it's still very much as early days. They only got back up and running in February. So there's a real desire to get things moved on, but it's the parliamentary processes, the assembly processes need to get through. Yeah, we've been in, we've looked, we meet up with Jim and the commission uh, on a monthly basis for the single electricity market committee. And we've looked in jealousy in terms of the every month that when CRU give their updates on what they've, what's been passed through legislation, what's been able to be taken through. And we haven't been able to do that. We've been, in, yeah. as you say, and I think, you know, we need to look forward. The, you know, the Good Friday Agreement was uh, 25 years old last year. But I think for eight of those 25 years, we haven't had um, yeah. the assembly up and okay. running for one reason or another. And that's just held us back. You know, uh, as has been mentioned before, uh, and the title of this conference, Accelerate, you know, it, it's very hard to accelerate when you kind of put your foot on the accelerator. So it, it's great we're back up and running. It's going to take time for the um, uh, assembly members to get up to speed. There's a lot of new assembly members who have to learn their brief and things like that. But yeah, it, it's, it's a huge step forward. Has the, uh, and I won't bounce you into a unity debate, but obviously um, looking at politics on the island of Ireland, like, I mean, does that change of the political leadership, does that have a, a dynamic in terms of how the politicians are engaging on the big on this issue? Yeah, well, yes, it, it is changed. So the new uh, economy minister is Conor Murphy in Fane. That has a different perspective maybe to the previous ministers, but... Um, but I think there's always been that will. You know, the single electricity market is excellent. You know, uh, we work very well in partnership with each other. We really try to look on an all-island basis to move it on. There's a good working relationship. You know, I think it's one of the, the positive all-island... It's always been one of the positive uh, all-island mechanisms. It was the golden goose of the Brexit negotiations. Um, so it's really important that we do work together on an all-island basis. You know, Northern Ireland's far too small uh, to operate by itself. It needs to work on an all-island basis. It work, needs to work east-west with the UK, with Great Britain as well. But, you know, we have to work together to achieve these targets. You know, just the nature of our energy market, both north and south, with interconnectors, the gas coming over from Scotland and one thing, we have to work together. Can I ask you, Jim, um, and obviously it touches on what Michael was saying earlier about the scale of investment uh, to deliver the targets is staggering. It's into the trillions. How do we make sure that we protect the investment and ensure that that investment, I suppose, is done efficiently, it's cost effectively? Do we have enough policy levers in respect of investment in place? Because yeah, there's a so lot of I risk management there. Yeah, so I think, there, I think, again, the policy North Stars have been set so we see 2050 with a very consistent policy target actually between um, the UK and Northern Ireland and ourselves even for 2030 interim targets there's real consistency there and um, I think what's important is communication where 90% um, of the technologies that we need are in front of us for the transition right now their business cases are very well understood and their financing is really well understood, but we tend to find ourselves talking about the last 10% and arguing publicly about the last 10% and arguing at fora like these about the last 10%, and that's really unhelpful from a policy perspective, from a public confidence perspective, and from perspectives of those who finance them when they're looking for consistency and a clear regulatory regime and a clear policy regime. Um, <clears throat> We're in a very fast changing environment though. So we need to invest in technologies now where we know their technological life is going to be 15 or 20 or 25 years, but we're not sure any more of their economic life. So let's say new thermal plant we need to invest in now. So who manages those risks? So the market has to send a signal to say, we need this sort of volume for this period of time. And then it can provide support or certainty for an investment case for a period of a number of years. But where previously an investor might have thought, I know I will have residual value after a 10-year period of a contract, whether that's a PPA for renewables or whether that's a capacity contract for a thermal generator, the residual value, the, res the, the commercial life that's residual after that is less certain than it was. So it's a matter of seeing how do we first understand the scale of those costs, then calculate them, then allocate them to the people who best understand them and can best control them. 
And that's the challenge that we face now. But it's a challenge that I think is being worked through, and there is more clarity around it than there once was. I think there's also a risk around us divesting ourselves of assets. So if we look at our gas network, it's not clear how much of that will be retained. It's not clear how much of that will be retained to do what, to use what type of molecules. And where that's the case, um, we might have to look at depreciation rates. And where we might traditionally have depreciated over, the, over a number of decades for certain gas assets, how do we change the depreciation of those assets? And how does that pass then through to consumers? Um, two final points on this piece. I think there is policy clarity. I think there's a reasonable level of regulatory certainty. I think we can always increase that. A regulator will try to avoid nugatory investment, but it's not rational to think that we can have zero nugatory investment, particularly now. So we work with industry to try to understand what can we do, what is a rational signal, and then how do we best price and pay the risk. The problem we have is that an awful lot of the dialogue is around the cost of that transition. And collectively, we need to bring ourselves back to a point where we're talking about the value of the transition and the fact that we can buy a fantastic future now for far cheaper than if we don't buy it now and we go shopping for it through lots of adaptation measures in about 20 or 30 years' time. And we're not communicating that. Every time humans interact with electricity or energy over the past two or three years, it's because there's been a security crisis or there's been a price crisis or we're not meeting decarbonisation targets. So their only psychological association with energy has been negative. And that's not good enough anymore. And the incoherence and conflict around that last 10% isn't good enough anymore. It's not going to get us the societal buy-in that we need to get the political motivation that we need to make sure we deliver on it. Um, Laura, as on land, so on sea or on the seabed, but the stability of the regulatory framework is also key. How do you, much do you, a much convergence or di divergence is there for you as a marine um, regulator? You know, do you have sufficient uh, regulatory and legal frameworks when there's a lot of concern in some quarters about the overlappings of the law, the regulatory mm -hmm. mandates? Is that sufficiently clear for you? So I think the answer is yes. I mean, in the same way that Jim talks about sort of the North Star in terms of what are our policy objectives, what are we trying to achieve, that's there in the marine environment as well. You know, whether it's through the National Marine Planning Framework or the Maritime Area Planning Act that, that was passed in, in um, 2021, like that for us are kind of the key um, sort of, you know, regulatory frameworks, you know, both establishing MARA and kind of setting those regulatory tools and putting them in place. I mean, there have been, and, and, and there's probably sort of the challenges that have existed in the terrestrial environment when it comes to planning and when it comes to sort of environmental assessment. Those are translating into the marine environment. So it's exactly the sort of same challenges that you know we've sort of seen coming from sort of wind plants and and you know those that were successful in res getting challenged through the judicial system. You know those same challenges exist in in for anything that um, has the potential to be developed in, in the marine environment. And and I think it's you know where where Mara comes in is you know. We do have a, a role around appropriate assessment under the birds and habitats for maritime usage licenses. Now, we're, we're just starting that. We're, we're shortly going to be sort of issuing our first kind of licenses that have been through that full and uh, appropriate assessment process. Now, for better or worse, many of those same, cha those same licenses that were awarded through the old Foreshore Act have ended up in the courts. Um, and, 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 you know, I was sort of struck by kind of what, um, what Michael said today about, and I can't remember the exact phrase as to which of the ho uh, horsemen of the apocalypse it was, but maybe it was kind of predatory disruption, I think, might have been. I think, was that yeah. the, what the last one was? Okay. And, and, and that struck a chord with me because the legal challenges that are coming through for what is effectively a right that somebody has been given. So somebody goes through the process of, of, of applying for a maritime usage license for site investigation. They've been awarded that license. That is a right for them to do that. It's a right that's been given by the state. Where, where the maritime area is kind of particularly challenging is that there are other people out there that have different rights, mm -hmm. um, particular fishers. And so it's the clash of sort of two sets of people 
both legitimately perceiving that they have the right to be out in the water and do something? And how do we accommodate that? And that's kind of an all a government approach that needs to be done. And aligned or to that is that you're, you're there to facilitate marine development, but and also it's another big legal area you can't adversely affect the marine environment and habitats. That's a, a, another kind of big area. So do you have all of the the data and everything that you need to manage yeah. that? Because that's another difficult balance. Yeah, I mean, I think the data issue is a huge one. So um, obviously today we sort of have SAC, Special Areas of Conservation, and SPA, Special Protection Areas, are in existence. And, and, and those are, you know, sort of quite kind of, you know, we're, we're all sort of quite comfortable with those. We have, we have a lot of experience. Um, but we, we are sort of working probably in a data vacuum across some areas. And so one of the things we've sort of seen, even as the government works through, for example, under the MAP Act, there's the designated marine area uh, plans. And so they've been sort of working on collecting more data on that. But, but we do, we are challenged by a lack of data. And particularly when it comes to sort of regulation, when it comes to sort of planning approvals, even when it comes to doing things like, um, for example, kind of requiring remediation at the end of development. So you put a wind farm in the, in the water, it's there for 20, 25, 30 years. As part of the development consent, you also need to look at what do we need to do about remediation, but remediation needs to know what the baseline is. So one of the key kind of sort of pieces that Mara will be sort of working on is how do we gather that data for good decision making? Um, and, and probably another piece where I think is sort of quite interesting with Mara in the marine area is it's the transboundary issue because, you know, <laughs> We, 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 we have an imaginary fictitious line that goes down the Irish Sea and, you know, where we operate on the west side and the Welsh operate on the east side. But, you know, last we checked, the fish, the dolphins, the poor horses and the birds Weren't don't observing that. We're, haven't been observing that line. But we've been measuring our bit. They've been measuring their bit. And, and I think for us kind of putting in place or thinking about those transboundary issues is going to become more and more important as we sort of see the first six phase one projects getting built out. You know, and even the new projects where we're looking at the south coast area and the DMAP there, surprise, surprise, the areas that we think are really good for development are exactly the same mm -hmm. as what the, the yeah. UK and, and sort of the of Celtic sea piece that yeah. they're looking at. Um, and just around it, just please, because it really does enrich the conversation, keep all of your questions and observation comes in. I know there's, there's quite a few coming in for you already. Um, I want to go back to you, John, just um, on you know, Good Friday Agreement, 25 years plus now, but the last time there was a big major regulatory update in Northern Ireland, it was uh, 21 years ago in 2003, and this was an issue that you brought to the attention of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, um, looking at the barriers to renewable energy just recently in January, and you said that you needed, you need right now for your legislative powers to come up to date with Ireland and Great Britain. So what are, what are you lacking in this sort of in-between with knowing what the targets and the delivery? What are, what are you lacking in between? What do you need to implement those goals? Well, as you saw from the graphs back then, it's just common sense. The world has changed so much since 2003. So we have four statutory duties, you know, four things we have to do in terms of consumer protection, making sure the industry works well, promoting competition, and promoting the gas industry, which, whether that's correct in this day and age. But you compare, I, I don't know how many uh, objectives Jim has, but regulators are creatures of statute. We can only do what uh, the parliamentary authorities allow us to do. And sometimes in, I know the legislation's different in Ireland, but in the UK, that sometimes regulators get uh, accused of being lazy uh, because they don't decide to do X, Y, and Z. But we don't have the royal prerogative that other government departments have. So royal prerogative allows government departments, if the minister wants them to do it, they're do able they to want. do it. We cannot do that. So. Uh, and why our legislation, you know, we were talking to Ofgem earlier this week, the, the GB regulator, and they've got 36 duties. They've got 36, now that's probably too much, but they've got, two, they've got 36 lenses by which they need to see the world. We can only see the world in four ways. And so we need to be able to look at climate change. We need to be able to see, support the, this journey better. And there's a lot of practical things that we cannot do. So 
the mandate that we've got, we cannot, for example, we cannot give licenses for batteries. So we have to give generation licenses. We cannot give interconnector licenses. Uh, so we have to give uh, transmission licenses. Gas, as uh, Kieran from EP at the back, and we've just, the two new gas powered stations are coming on a kill route. We couldn't give a shipper license for the gas coming into uh, kill route. We had to give a supply license. And that's all right, well and good, but it is an airfix kit that you're trying to um, modify all the time. And that's fine until we get into legal proceedings. And, mm -hmm. you know, regulation's all about giving people the foundation, that solid foundation, uh, so the industry can build on that going forward. If we kind of provide that solid foundation, it's going to make the journey to net zero weaker and harder. So if Ofgem has moved on and we're in this more clarity, but still, I suppose, a strange liminal space in the wake of Brexit, how can you protect the consumers in Northern Ireland in the context, you know, of an all-Ireland and European markets? Like, I mean, there must be still quite a number of obstacles in your path. There is. You know, consumer protection is our number one duty, you know, and we see the world through that. And we, over the last, with COVID and the price breaks after Ukraine, we've had to come up with innovative ways of working in partnership with the industry to try and come up with things like charters that we possibly don't have some of the regulatory powers to come up, but you know, trying to say, look, this is the good way forward. Can we come together and approve that? That speeds things up, but it's always good to have that uh, legislative backing yeah. for what you do. To, to what you do. Um, I know, um, Laura, there's no sort of direct analogous agency in Europe, um, Tamara, but who are you speaking to in terms of kind of peer development or navigating the constraints and opportunities? It's interesting to see Michael has sort of tied us in with Denmark, you know, kind of, you know, who, who are you out there uh, chatting to? Yeah, so um, it is like we've done a lot of looking around and saying, is there an exact analogy? And there isn't. So what we've seen is kind of our role is split across different agencies in different mm -hmm. places. So one, one country we, we, we do look to kind of quite a bit is Scotland. So our role is split between what Mara does is part what Crown Estate Scotland does in terms of what they do around seabed leasing is what we do with regard to um, maritime area consents. And then Marine Scotland as well, we've been talking to, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of sort of the licensing piece. And then they have the same role as on board Planola with regard to issuing planning consent, but obviously Mara won't be issuing the planning consent, but we're responsible for the compliance and enforcement of any planning conditions. So again, Marine Scotland kind of does that role. So we've been talking to them. Um, we've also been talking to the Netherlands, I think sort of RVO, so the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, and they're the agency in the Netherlands that kind of deal with tenders for, so they look at kind of the whole suite of licensing planning and, and tendering for seabed leases for offshore development. So kind of we, we've been talking to them and sort of I think they're, they're a very interesting model and, and sort of quite well advanced and have done probably as you sort of said, you know, their skinny bit of coastline, they've fitted an awful lot of stuff in there. So managing that spatial squeeze and, and, and kind of conflict management is, is something they've done quite well. Um, and then obviously sort of close, much closer to home as well then is sort of natural resources Wales. So they have, they, they do a lot of the same in terms of sort of licensing of marine usages and we're quite impressed by kind of sort of a lot of what they've done around sort of data collection and sharing and they have kind of a common sort of marine environment data set that they have collected and is sort of used for both the planning conditions piece and the sort of marine usage licenses so so we're also talking and to then them. presumably like like many a, a sort of a, a complex um set of stakeholders you know obviously you've got the developers you know business the state itself but ultimately uh the consumers and the public? So the consumers, the public, um, I mean, you know, but probably sort of for us, and I think it's kind of one of the pieces, you know, that we're sort of seeing coming through a lot of regulation, which, you know, sort of talked about, you know, we're a creature of statute, but for us kind of figuring out that sort of societal acceptance piece and how can we as a regulator contribute to that societal acceptance piece. So it's not just from the stakeholders in terms of developers that might be building or, you know, sort of telecom cable developers or, you know, ports is another big stakeholder that we have with regard to kind of expansion of port facilities to um, 
support the offshore renewables, but it's also the environmental NGOs because they're, they, you know, they have a voice and they have a very strong voice. So whether that's kind of fair seas, whereas Coast Watch, you know, it's, it's being able to kind of engage and understand where they're coming from and what sort of concerns they have to make sure that they are feeding into our decision making and, and sort of supporting that societal acceptance as well as other stakeholder groups we've involved in. For example, um, there's an ORE seafood working group that's all about kind of managing that spatial squeeze between the developers and, and the fishers, and we've obviously sort of participated in, in, in that as well. So, yeah, it, it's, it's la land and sea um, stakeholders, you know, yeah local coastal planning authorities as well obviously is a yeah. key one so yeah we have we have a long list <laughs> it was interesting um jim that when we sort of gave the fictitious magic wand to michael liebreich what he was saying was you know to it was around uh, political reform or campaign reform in the us but at it's hard it was a question about communication mm. and engaging customers engaging skeptics engaging those who perhaps aren't on the journey is seen as key how, how do you think that's going and um, maybe in the first instance from your own perspective at the CRU but also just me maybe in terms of the whole I suppose energy ecosystem um, you're not <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> this could be a very short uh, <laughs> it's answer. Great. as a civil engineer and an economic regulator I'm being asked about um, but, the but sociological you, aspects of it but I'm happy to have to crack into it it's, it's vitally important. No economic signal will work uh, without humans believing in the value of that economic signal and understanding that economic signal. And that's a human who may be running a multi-million euro business in Leakslip, or it's a human who might be sitting in a peri-urban environment in Manute or Kildare, you know? So I think, um, I think the matching of that, the sort of the matching of intent and facilitating more active consumers of both types is something that's become more important and probably more accessible to us in recent times. And by that I mean if you look at the work being done by both the SB networks and Airgrid, and compared to perhaps 15, 20 years ago, again exposing the civil engineer and myself, um, we perceived the electricity system to be, a, to be one that was full of non-return valves with just one directional flow. And quite simply with the resources that we have, and the type of value we want to drive from those resources. Again, that's not good enough anymore. But you can see economic signals, you can see technology, you can see our system operators turning in that direction all the time. So we now have close to 2 million smart meters rolled out, I think. I think it's 1.7, 1 1.8, something like that. In any case, um, we see an uptake of time of use tariffs. We want that to increase so the consumer can really see there's value there. Uh, over the course of the last number of months, the time of use tariffs for the first time were of greater value than both the traditional tariff and also the day-night tariff for consumers. But consumers well, don't necessarily... Well, just to put you under a tiny bit of pressure, oh, yeah. it's not me, it's Rob Costello in the audience. He says, well, just speaking to Jim's point, um, uh, look at the headline today's Irish Times, electricity customers to foot the €5 billion Euro bill for the offshore grid. Rob says, who can lead the way in changing the narrative? And do you have a role in doing that? Yeah, so I'm delighted to address that question, to be honest with you. It's a particular hobby horse. So again, it's down to cost or value. So the 5 billion euro that Airgood have been tasked with investing by a policy decision a number of years ago to facilitate our first couple of phases of offshore development is in the wires to bring those electrons ashore. Of that 5 billion euro, there will be a requirement to pay for it. But that'll be a combination of perhaps government equity, then also financing to a large extent, and then the tariffs from the consumer to repay that. But if that's only perceived as a cost, then we've all failed. If consumers think that that needs to be repaid back in just a five-year period because they hear of a five-year price review, then they're not understanding that we depreciate assets like that over 45 and 50 years. Mm. And again, these are things that people just don't hear, they don't understand, they don't see. But that's something we have to address. So the latest price review, for example, we're moving from what used to be an output-based approach, which was show us the number of substations and show us the amount of copper that had been delivered in wires, to more outcomes. So it is show us how many wind farms were connected, show us how we've reduced curtailment and constraint on the system, which was price review five. 
In Price Review 6, we must move it to a place where we are saying the investment in the last quarter or six months has provided us with this saving in terms of curtailment and constraint. This CO2 dividend and this security supply dividend. So people understand the value of the investment, not the cost of the transition. And that then needs to devolve down into price signals to the consumer. And, and one final point on this maybe, um, I think as we get a more active consumer, where we facilitate them being more active, and we then send them the price signals that they can understand and activate upon, the other part of the system needs to manage that flexibility as well and respond to that flexibility as well. So how we manage our system. Some of the innovation in the operations and in the control room in Ergot over the last number of years around scheduling and dispatch and how we manage that. The work being undertaken there is going to be critical. Needs our backing, needs our support. And the final, final point is back to that point around how the public perceives energy and perceives infrastructure. When it comes to the infrastructure we need, not just communicating value, people only interact with infrastructure in this country and think about it when something goes wrong with it or when some new infrastructure is needed so it's an imposition mm -hmm. on my life or my locality. People don't turn on their tap or turn on their gas cooker or turn on their light and immediately think, I value this for the service it's giving me today. I understand that more of this might be required for my quality of life and the preservation of the environment and the economy. So collectively, again, people need to understand that fundamental value in the infrastructure that we have as distinct from only interacting with it in the negative. Again, where something's gone wrong or where we need more of it. No more than the last couple of years where the times they have psychologically interacted with the transition were where we've had a price crisis in energy or a security crisis in energy. So again, the psychology was, I'm only interacting and thinking about energy where we mightn't have it anymore or it's extraordinarily expensive. John, uh, Jan Moore has a question, um, and I'd be interested as to how the community's piece plays out for you. Um, uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, Jan asked, what are the opportunities for communities in the transition to share in the local value of renewables? And what are the potential enabling regulatory mechanisms? Um, in, in that all important piece around communicating, particularly in respect of the, the just transition, um, are we seeing those opportunities enough? The conversation's starting. Um, you know, I, it is one of the huge opportunities to, you know, the electricity, your, your heating is going to be produced closer to where you use it. You know, it's not going to be, you know, less the use of big power stations and transmit. You know, so the communities need to see the benefits of uh, the investment or that they're, 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 they're putting in. There's a lot of conversations behind the scenes about how that can be done. Our powers need to change. We have to treat every consumer exactly the same, doesn't matter where they live in Northern Ireland. So we need to be able to uh, support that. Um, but I think that has to occur as we move towards, you know, that uh, decentralized nature of, of energy is going to become more and more and more, and com communities need to be able to see the benefit for that. I just want to pick up, thank you, John, for that. Just saw another question from the audience, and we touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, the question is, does the current legislative framework adequately balance the need to develop offshore energy infrastructure with the need to protect the seabed and key aspects of marine biodiversity? Is that something you're keeping an eye on? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, probably what will be of really in good interest will be sort of the first DMAP that's coming out on the South Coast. And that's been very much designed to say, you know, a DMAP is where development can take place. So we have certain areas that are sort of designated as special areas of conservation, and we're also sort of, you know, looking at kind of marine protected areas that legislation is still in development. But what we have is kind of, the, the DMAP is sort of, I would view is, as, as it's a, key new piece of the legislative framework that we're literally is just kind of working its way through the system. I think the first one on the South Coast is due to be published by DEC um, next week or the week after. But that's all about having looked at the marine environment, having looked at sort of traditional shipping, uh, shipping routes, having looked at areas uh, for fishing, having looked at kind of you know, sort of visibility and, and, and visibility from shore. And it's sort of saying, 
these are good areas for development. So it's not that sort of protecting the marine environment and development are incompatible. It's, it's there's plenty of space out there. We just have to use it wisely. And I also think there's a little bit of sort of thinking a bit into the future and sort of coexistence because, you know, you know, if you are not fishing in certain areas, and, and we've sort of seen this in, in some other countries, particularly around sort of rehabilitation with sort of old oil rigs that were kind of left in the ground, and suddenly the fish came back, and they actually have the same benefit as having coral reefs there. So we have the potential to think a little bit differently about, you know, sort of the, you know, when you are building an offshore wind farm, and you are sort of saying, well, that's now going to be not an area where some other activity is going to take place. You know, there's a high likelihood that the fish will come back, that it's a, it's, it's a good news story once the development has been done. So sort of thinking kind of, for me, it's sort of, I think it's, there's the, we have the opportunity now to think a little bit differently about coexistence rather than sort of conflict within the marine space. I had to read twice. I thought it said, what paramilitary powers would the regulators <laughs> like? It's parliamentary. Um, uh, Can we have the paramilitary? <laughs> what, I, I don't think they're looking for any uh, paramilitary powers, but the parliamentary powers. Um, uh, Jim, for you, do, do you need any more to enable uh, progress? Are you happy with an audience question just saying, do you have the powers in place that you need? Obviously, John has very um, uh, clearly identified uh, what he lacks. I think, uh, I think it's a good question. Uh, to start with. I think if you consider that the jigsaw pieces of the Irish energy uh, ecosystem on the public policy on the governmental side were set in and around 1998 through 2003. If you think about the current framework, what the department does, um, Airgrid, ESB Networks, Gas Networks Ireland, they all have a future focusing aspect of what they do, the regulator and the regulatory functions. And it's worth asking the question, and considering the policy around this and the structure of all of those organizations, does that jigsaw still fit? Are the right functions placed within the right organizations for what we now need to do? Um, I think if, if I speak selfishly for a moment, um, our legislation has developed in a patchwork way over the course of 20, 23, 24 odd years. Um, that creates not conflict, but some incoherence sometimes across our brief. Our brief has been added to with different functions over the years, which provides potentially distraction. Um, so I think that that sort of review, and one analogous to that is underway right now for ourselves, is really helpful. And some people fear change, but to be quite honest with you, it's an opportunity. So I think that's important, but it needs to be in the context of the overall picture. So again, if I see an investment opportunity in Ireland, are the jigsaw pieces in the right place? If I'm the customer, if an investor in a large piece of infrastructure, instead of, instead of treating them like someone who has to meet a high bar, imagine if we started considering them like a customer who has to go through a customer journey. And we looked at all the processes and the steps they have to go through to get to the end goal. The end goal being a cost-effective project that delivers in alignment with our policy goals. It's, it's something that we probably haven't done before and something that needs doing. John, looking at these sort of the, the healthy employment um, figures uh, north and south of the border, and one of the questions is how are you managing resources and output expectations in a tight labour market? And especially when Michael referenced earlier, you know, that, that sort of huge flock of talent to the sector, so it's a lot of work and demand. Is that something you have an eye to? It is. Well, as a regulator, with like CIU, we're, we're trying to double in size. You know, the, mm. the challenge. You know, in Northern Ireland was all based on really regulating three standard power stations. Those days are gone. The complexity of the market. We need different skills in our organization. So we need to bring in more people. We need to get the talent. In. We need to get the right level of talent. Not from us, though, John. Uh, well, <laughs> not from you, and vice versa. Um, but uh, we, need to, um, we need to get the right level of talent. We need to train our staff up. You know, we've got... a. You know, and quite a lot of times the conversation with industry is, well, you're stealing X from us. Well, you're probably... But we've got to talk about the energy family, I think. We've got to start looking coherently across the islands and, and further afield, maybe. How do we develop the skills we all need? 
Because if they spend five years in the regulator, then go five years to industry and five years, that's brilliant. We've kept them within the industry. We need to do that more, you know, instead of them and us, we need to be looking at this more collectively together and how do we develop the right level? Because we need each other. We're only as su sex successful as a regulator if the industry is successful. The industry can only be successful if the regulator moves quickly and makes the right decisions. And you know, I'm, you know, there's many more of those kind of relationships. So I think we need to be a bit more holistic instead of them and us and everything like that. We need to work out how to collectively together how we can train everyone in the island of Ireland to support this journey and that we have the necessary skills. Well, speaking of that, um, that energy family, John Fitzgerald's question has landed uh, in my uh, little uh, slido up very handily. Laura and um, Jim, do we continue vis-a-vis -vis the energy family to have separate incentives for wind and solar and everything, or do we develop an integrated market structure for electricity to deliver decarbonisation? You're sitting <laughs> smiling pensively there, Jim, we'll go to you. I think Laura's delighted she's not in the CRU. <laughs> no, no, I, I, has I have has lots of other very specific questions for Laura here as well. Thoughts? Um, I'm going to make one quick point on that and then I'll get to John Fitzgerald's question. I would note there are at least two to three different John Fitzgeralds in the <laughs> Irish energy family, so I'm not sure which one is A asking John the Fitzgerald asked. Thank you. <laughs> um, the supply chain, I'll be very, very quick. The last couple of years, people have tended to focus on the materials supply chain, as distinct from the human supply chain. If we imagine all the electrification we're talking about and all the movement into green and decarbonisation we're talking about, it can take an awful lot longer to create new college courses and create the types of apprenticeships and professional pathways that we need to. That can be a 5, 10, 15 year story arc, as distinct from redirecting something around the Horn of Africa that was going to go through the Suez Canal. So I think the human resource supply chain, we can't forget that when we talk about supply chain. Mm. In terms of John Fitzgerald's question, um, I think there are two key points to that. The first is, do you treat technology types differently in renewable electricity support schemes? Um, do you consider them to provide the same service where they don't? And do you consider them to have the same financing cases where they don't necessarily? So I think it would be very simple, perhaps, easier to have them compete against one another and just try to put in some sort of levelized cost of energy equivalent metric in place. But I'm not sure that is necessarily the case because they provide different services at different points in time. And we should be able to recognize that differentiated value and then provide support where that is required. And that support need not necessarily mean subvention. It could just mean clarity and certainty. Laura. Yeah, I mean, I think, so if you look maybe at the offshore renewables, sort of how long it takes to develop a project. So, I mean, and, and this is probably one difference between sort of the terrestrial environment and the marine environment. It's probably 10 years from getting a seabed, the access to your seabed rights to actually getting energized. And in that 10 years, what you might be looking to use that electricity for might well change. So today, you know, and certainly for the phase one projects, it's very much about meeting onshore electricity demand for residential industrial customers, right? The expectation is it's going to be used in Ireland for electricity consumption. But if you were starting to build, you know, and, and, and you're sort of, you're very much starting at the first step of looking at a project today and you're thinking, okay, this project is going to start develop, delivering electrons in 2034. What those electrons might be used for or where they might go is probably not known today. So maybe it's going to be hydrogen, maybe it's going to be a hydrolyzer, you know, out in the sea with a pipe, you know, to shore. Maybe it's going to be a, a, a dedicated transmission line that brings it into a hydrogen station. Maybe it's it's going to be we're sort of tapped out on, on, on Irish demand and those same electrons that are sitting in the Celtic Sea are going somewhere in the UK or somewhere to France. And I think that's possibly where sort of some of the offshore space is quite different that and, and particularly for the length of time it takes to start developing these projects. So it's almost like you have to get the project started 
and then figure out what are you going to do with the electrons. So you're probably a little way off sort of that full-on integration in, in that sense, but it's, it's sort of if we do want to achieve our targets, and the government has extremely ambitious offshore renewable targets, and we're talking about 37 gigawatts, you need to start looking at, at taking those initial development stages now, because by the time you get to actually having 37 gigawatts out there, you know, we ha probably don't know what it's going to be used for. But if you try and figure that bit out before you get started, you might never get anywhere. Absolutely. Uh, just really briefly, there's a second half to John's question, which I think is really important to provide an answer to, even if I don't have the answer. Um, I, I think a question that we need to ask ourselves and that Europe almost asked itself at the time of the crisis was, what should a market look like when we have 80 or 90% renewables? And when the marginal price of those renewables may or may not be supported, but may be close to zero, should the type of market model we have now continue, marginal pricing, um, what should be the extent of locational marginal pricing within that? And I think when the Russian invasion of Ukraine happened and the crisis occurred, Europe began to ask that question in parallel to the question about certainty of supply and how we deal with volatility in the market. And then it focused more on the volatility piece and keeping the core of the current market in place. And I think part of that was because they did not want to make long-term decisions in a crisis. And I think that was probably the right decision. But I think it is inevitable that the question will be asked in Europe over the coming short number of years as to what the market should look like in a world where we are primarily renewables, primarily intermittent renewables, with backup that remains redundant for potentially 90, 95% of the time. Um, and, and we'll, yeah, we'll and really be picking up that. That is something that... Yeah, we'll be picking that up, obviously, probably in, in the policy and technology sure. panel, because it really, really speaks to that. But for now, to Laura Bryan, to John French and Jim Gallon, thank you very, very, very much. <laughs> <laughs>